Hi, my name is Natasha Wright, and you are tuned in to Event Gems, where I will discuss all things event related and take a deep dive into creating concepts, marketing, and execution for your next biz event. My goal is to bring you industry experts who can help you properly monetize and effectively strategize so that you can make your business shine. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Event Gems. My name is Natasha Wright, Chief Experience Curator at the Diamond Butterfly Production, and I am super excited for my conversation today with Victoria Matti. Uh, so today we're going to be talking all about how to really plan events for your organization, or if you are in an educational space, higher education, um, then we, we're going to talk about some ways in which you can build community, um, really organize and support uh, the persons within your organization. So welcome, Victoria. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to be on your show. Absolutely. I'm super excited for this conversation because I do feel that um, it's one of the topics that I don't necessarily focus on, but I feel like it's such an important topic, especially for uh, persons who are organizing events um, as a part of an organization. Uh, so uh, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? How is it that you came to uh, how is it that you came to do what you were doing? And now you're a podcaster. So can you talk about the transition there as well? Yeah, 100%. So I started organizing as a student at Whatcom Community College, and it was my first job. Um, I am an undocumented person and was not able to apply for work in the United States until I received DACA. And DACA really changed my life for me. It gave me the opportunity to apply myself and get support that I hadn't had in the past. Um, so when I was at Wacom, there was student, you know, people applying for positions to plan events, to be on the programming and diversity board, to be engaged actively in higher education. And I was like, this is great. I can do this, manage my classes, and it's flexible. And turns out I ended up loving it. I ended up event loving event planning. I had amazing mentors that helped me transition into even higher event planning positions. Um, after my second year there, I planned a, an entire conference with a committee and I had no idea what I was doing. But the best thing is that people believed in me and that people trusted me, right? Um, mm -hmm. That event ended up being amazing and I just really wanted to stick with it. Um, moving forward, I went to Western Washington University. I kept event planning from, again, conferences, attending conferences. I'm a speaker first and foremost. So speaking at a lot of events and make like always assessing um, how we could be better for students, how we could be more inclusive, the, how we were going to make sure that people took action after those events, right? That mm -hmm. they took the information we taught them and used it in their everyday lives and shared it with others. Um, once I graduated, I became the programming and events manager at Western Washington University for their multicultural center. And again, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that I could plan events and I knew that I had people that I could count on to support me in that. Um, so navigating all of that was a really beautiful experience because it really pushed my limits. I, it was always a challenge, right? Like that rush of an event day is one of the best feelings in the world. <laughs> Even if things like go wrong, you just like go. That go mode is one of my favorite things. Um, and like you mentioned, I have transitioned to full-time podcasting. I am the host of Shot of Truth Podcast. And all of the skills I learned in event planning are applicable here and now. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, I love that. And you know what? I, I think that that's such an interesting uh, trajectory to hear your story um, from being undocumented to, you know, working in different spaces. And, and what I hear also in the background of it all is that you had support, that you had people who supported you, who believed in you, and also that you don't have to feel like you have, you have it all figured out right away. You can pretty much, you know, say, all right, I have the confidence in myself that I will figure it out, that I can do this, and then just go with it and 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 start you know essentially so i think that that's such an important point um that you brought up uh i think um during the you know civil protests um that we saw last year um particularly with the black lives matter black lives matter movement um one of the things that um i noticed especially within the event space is that there was a lot more talk about diversity and there was a lot more talk about inclusion um so can you talk about from your perspective um you know why that is important and some of the things that you've decided to incorporate um, as you go through as a speaker um, or an event planner, um, why that's important to, to have that multicultural voice. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, a lot of people of color, women of color, 
black women, black men, this is the first time that we're entering these spaces and really challenging them and pushing them to be better, right? Mm -hmm. We know we know what our students need, we know what our communities need. Um, and for us to be able to take that microphone and take the lead on those events is one of the most important things we can do. Um, you know, I truly believe that we know what our communities need most. Um, and so when we create these spaces, we're not just creating them for ourselves, we're creating them again, for, to motivate people, to be there for people, to build community, to network, um, all these things that I feel are crucial to people's internal success, external success. Um, we had a lot of, you know, making sure that when I worked in higher education, like making sure that students had what they needed during that time, had access to counselors, even though, you know, we weren't in person, um, making sure that people had access to food. Um, you know, we often know that students of color in particular don't have access to as many things as their white counterparts. So it's up to us as, you know, student affair professionals of color to make that change and push institutions to be better. Um, and that's a lot of work, right? Because you're tackling a huge institution, you're tackling white professionalism and navigating a system that maybe people before you have not. Yeah, I, I yeah, I think that that's that is so true. And I think, um, you know, when you were talking, like, I, I'm even thinking about like, what about like the red tape of, you know, like doing certain things? Like, did you come up against um, any red tape in terms of any issues or agenda that you wanted to push, particularly in that time? Yeah, I think that, you know, Students are always organizing and, and I'm talking specifically about students because that's my experience in working mm -hmm. around events. But like mm -hmm. students are always organizing because they know that they deserve so much more. And so, you know, if there's an event that isn't intentional, that isn't planned well, that isn't inclusive, that doesn't provide something for them, then it's not working. And they will let you know. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that's where that's when we listen as professionals and we're like, all right, what can we do to be better? And I think what often happens is a lot of people take that as an attack when it's not when it's people really trying to justify and fight for for what they need and what they want and for other generations that come after them. Yeah, absolutely. And it shouldn't just be on us as people of color to advocate for ourselves, right? Um, so it's 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 very important that we let our voices be known and heard so that, you know, others can also advocate on our behalf. So I think that that's such an important point. And then so let's talk about building community, um, because I do believe that that's an important part of of making more impact um, and, and doing things in a way that can be more inclusive and, and can be multicultural. And also, I think, uh, just provide and more information so that the broader um, society can understand like what it you know what it is from different perspectives right uh, so can you talk about how can how can events like help us I know one of the points that you brought up was intentionality and I think that that's such an important point uh, but how can we be intentional about building communities or using events to build communities and why is that important uh, you know I think starting with like, who's your audience and going from there, what does this community need most? What what is this community? What kind of speakers do they want to see? How can we create spaces within these events where people are able and comfortable to have conversations and network with people? Um, I think that, and another thing, you know, this is so small, but I think it's so big and it's providing food at these events, especially like in-person events, because we as communities of color, typically celebrate over food and food is always part of our celebrations. Of yes. <laughs> Cause I even love food. <laughs> yeah. And even when things are hard, right. We, we mm -hmm. heal through food, we heal and, you know, move our bodies through dance in ways of celebration and healing. And I think, you know, finding that and building off of that, um, you know, when building community, like, I think the biggest thing is like, how can we move forward? How can we continue this? How can we make this not just a here and now moment, but how can we continue this relationship? How can we work together in the future? How can we build upon this? How can we take action? And I always tell people like, we are all educators. And as educators, mm -hmm. we need to challenge these systems. We need to build upon them. And we need to make sure that other people have access to them too. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things, too, I think, um, especially with events, is that you definitely have to, like, bring in some type of element that will break it, you break up everything, you know, for for the attendees. So I love that you brought in dance and, you know, you can even bring in something that's wellness related or yoga related. Um, I think that those are important things. Like, even if you're dealing with, like, a heavy issue or a heavy topic, um, there's a way for you to, to break it up so that people so that the information can be retained. Um, but it's 
also a way for people to have fun um, while they're in this space uh, so that it could be more impactful for them. And so as we talk about just breaking things up, uh, you know, one of the things that has entered into our lexicon as a result of COVID-19 is Zoom fatigue, um, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. I think I, I, ha- I had a... Um, I had a uh, description of what that is. Uh, I read it online. So I'll just go ahead and say it here. I know that you guys have heard about it, but I just wanted to give you a further explanation of what it is. Uh, so Zoom fatigue has now entered our lexicon due to the pandemic. And it describes the tiredness, worry, or burnout associated with overusing virtual p- platforms for communication. Uh, so I know that you've planned some uh, virtual events, uh, some fun, some um, uh, cultural or civic related. Can you talk about how you're incorporating any type of engaging element so that we can break up uh, or deal with Zoom fatigue? Yeah. So whatever is interactive, I think people are going to kind of hold on to a little bit more. Um, I know this is like kind of hard to hear, but like whenever I do any kind of presentation or event, I always like say, how can I make this about them? And if I can make this about them, there's something that they can take away from this. Um, So, you know, there's ways to do interactive things where people can message something into their phone and it'll pop right up onto the screen. Right. So I think there's different tools that people are creating and using to make things a lot more engaging. Um, For example, I'm speaking at a conference this weekend and I'm like, how am I going to do breakout groups? I, I know people don't like that or, you know, it really depends on the people you're working with, too. Like, again, knowing your audience and knowing like, I know this group will work better in a larger group. I know this group will work better in small groups. Or maybe um, we send out a project for people to do and then they implement by sending in the photos, right? It doesn't have to be a virtual conversation. It could be something where people are like, hey, we're going to have this day. Take a photo, take these photos and upload them to these files and, you know, we'll do something with them. Um, There's ways to create even while being um, apart. And, you know, to speak to like kind of the work I've been doing, I'm recording more and working with more people now virtually than I ever have in person. So there are, you know, some pluses to all of this too, Mm -hmm. in, in access to who you can work with, people that you can work with literally outside of your state, outside of the country. And I think that's huge. And I think that's not gonna go away. So we need to find ways to be creative, right? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, sometimes I go on to some of these Zoom events and it's just like, oh my God, you know, um, after an hour or so, like you do feel that fatigue and you do feel like, all right, well, I, I need to go do something else or you start multitasking. Um, and, you know, multitasking is one of the, the worst ways, you know, you might feel like you can multitask, but I think it, it like reduces your productivity. I read a study that it reduces your productivity by about 40%. So if there is information information that's being said, uh, multitasking might not be the best way for you to be able to retain that information and to be engaged. But I think like some of the elements that you just spoke about before are great ways that we can incorporate um, to keep people engaged, keep them on longer, because I do feel that that's um, one of the challenges right now with uh, event organizers um, in the virtual event space is that it's it's you're not sure like how long people are going to stay on and it's difficult to like have them stay on for the entire event so doing things like that or virtual uh photo booths you know um Mm -hmm. that can really uh maximize the reach that your event has i think is is amazing and then so can you tell us a little bit about your podcast uh shot of truth uh what is it that you talk about what are some of the topics um that you speak about as there as well yeah so shot of truth podcast was really created because I had been speaking for seven years on being undocumented, but not so much my story, but really like, let's talk about the language. Let's talk about the criminalization of immigrants. Let's talk about the historical context. Let's talk about locally where we're at and how immigrants have been impacted here. And as I kept, you know, speaking and speaking, I was like, it's always me with the microphone, like me in front. Why me? And I was like, how can I make this more inclusive? How can I incorporate other people into this work? And my best friends and I just decided to start a podcast. And three years later, here we are. We just released our 43rd episode. And it's been one of the most amazing things I've ever done, right? And it was something you just had to jump in and do. Uh, We do topics around like undocumented folks and like, yes, their stories, but they share knowledge about their background, who they are, how Mm -hmm. they got their LLC, how to buy a home, you know, while you're undocumented, how to navigate higher education, learning about, we, we interviewed the lawyer that took the, uh, Supreme Court case to DACA Mm. and he's a DACA recipient himself and he's one of my closest friends now so like 
we're building community. We're building a network. We're sharing knowledge. We're we're sharing our stories in ways that people have never heard before, right? Or understood. Um, and so with this podcast, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm just going to keep doing it to the best of my ability and and hope that other people find the healing that I have within this space. Because personally, I was a really angry person. Mm-hmm. For so long and I was so hurt. I didn't un- I didn't know how to have these conversations. I didn't know how to build that community that I needed essentially to survive, right? And and now I have so much compassion for people, even if I don't agree with them. Like I have so much compassion for them because I know that we're ever evolving humans with so much to build and so much to create um, and so much to share too. Ah, uh, I love that. I mean, I'm an immigrant myself. And so I am so aligned with the work that you're doing. Um, so congratulations on what you guys have been doing with the podcast and just, you know, super inspiring the work that you're doing as well. Um, I do know a lot of undocumented workers are I'm sorry, undocumented immigrants. And it's, you know, it's it's a shadowy world, right? Um, yeah. to to be in in that space where you're constantly looking over your shoulder, you're not being sure, you know, you get taken advantage of uh, as a result of that. And so I think that the work that you guys are doing um just makes my heart smile. So so thank you for what you do. Um, and then, you know, I think I would love to hear like how you find your voice in that because, you know, you could have just been in the shadows and you could have um, like not come forward and have these conversations because, you know, for fear of what the um, retribution might be. So how did you find your voice to really like stand up and speak out about some of these issues? So I will say that I'm a little bit of a rebel, especially when I was younger. <laughs> and so when my parents said, don't talk about this, I was like, well, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to look up everything and I'm going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And this is when I was in sixth grade when Bush was being elected. Mm. And that's when I found my voice of like, I'm going to speak to this, even if people don't care, even if people have mean things to say. And people did have a lot of mean things to say. I was not treated well by some of my teachers in high school and middle school because of my situation. Um, But when I got into higher education, I felt so lost and so confused. And it wasn't until I found an undocumented student group that I was like, let's do this. Let's let's I was the president of Blue Group, the undocumented student club at Western Washington University in 2016, the year Trump got elected. Mm. I had no idea what that was going to mean for me. But I remember I told Blue Group that day, this is the year that nobody forgets who we are. And that's what we did. We worked with so many local organizations. We took students to lobby at the local level, state level, federal level. We were all over the news because we refused to stay silent, right? We knew that our families did so much to give us that voice. And even if it was scary for them, because it's still scary for them, Mm -hmm. um, we knew that if people saw us, And I always tell people when I present, I'm like, now that you saw me present, it is your social responsibility to show up if I get detained. Mm. I, you know, it's that action step. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to sit here and tell you my story or tell you, you know, X, Y, and Z. I need you to do something about it. And we're going to collectively do something about it because this is about humanity. This isn't about anything else. Um, And so I think once I found that voice and was able to help others find it, you can't stop. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super inspiring. And, and, and it's almost like it it becomes like a chain reaction too. And I love that you're like, listen, you need to do something about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just like hearing my story, but what is the action step um, that you're going to take? And I think also one of the things that I heard you say is, is about collaboration, Um, like how those collaborative efforts or, 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 um, or organizations that you worked with helped you to like really get your message out and get and and helped you like with the mission that you that your organization had. So can you talk about how we how do you collaborate? Like do you just reach out to people? Um, you know how how do you be strategic about um, collaboration, especially for a mission driven cause? Yeah, I mean I think the first thing was establishing establishing some kind of credibility of like I'm this person and I want to help other people. And I think once people saw that, you know, it was genuine, it was authentic work. um, People were much more willing to work with us, work with me. Um, I know that even with, you know, we got thrown into a lot of community organizing. We were hosting events and fundraisers like every single week, multiple of them. And I was always being pushed to my limits to keep, to just jump and do it. Right. And, and again, that was really just where, 
you know, where the magic happens <laughs> when you just jump in and do it. Um, I think that, you know, I've been able to connect with people from all over the country more recently because after three years, like our podcast is finally picking up. People know who we are. People are reaching out to us now to be on it. And and that's so rewarding. <laughs> it, I, I never thought that that would happen. Right. And I constantly battle with the like, why am I doing this? Why me? And and I think, again, it's that mindset. It's that imposter syndrome that all of us have to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, but jumping in and doing it is where the magic really does happen. I so agree with you. It's, it's, you know, you're doing something over and over. You're like, when is it going to quote unquote pay off? Or when are you going to get like your day in the, in, in the sun type of thing? Um, and sometimes the work that you're doing isn't necessarily recognized or people don't even really know about it. But then it comes this like tipping point where now people know about you. Now they're reaching out, you know? And so, um, I saw someone posted a, a t-shirt design or something and it was like, I'm dope. I've been, I've been dope. You late, you know? And I was like, I love that, I love that. because it's like, you know, first of all, you have to have the confidence and the belief in yourself to even start something, um, start something new or do a new venture. You know, there's a lot of things that could really get in the way, trepidation, fear, all of that. Um, and to actually like do it, like, you, and, and get to the place where you have the confidence to do it. Like, you're dope for even like stepping out, you know? So it's just a matter of uh, everybody else pretty much like catching up to it. And I think, you know, for, for a lot of the listeners, if you guys are, you know, new entrepreneurs, you're just starting out, um, just know that, you know, you just have to keep going. You just have to be consistent, um, you know, and consistently show up for yourself um, and continue to build your brand. And, you know, you'll get to a point where there is a tipping point, um, like you were talking about, Victoria, um, where now it, it's become more of a, a national um a national thing where uh, in uh, in collaborative effort um, with different organizations. Uh, so let's let's talk. Let's give the people some some gems about like staying inspired and staying in staying in motion. Like how has that worked for you for three years? You know, you could have been like, listen, you know, year one, I'm done. And I and I know it's a huge statistic of even podcasts that don't make it, you know, um, past their first year or even don't even make it fully out of a season. So can you talk about that, that process for you? Like, how do you stay inspired to, to keep doing this podcast to um, keep with the with the movement and the mission um, that you're working with? It is so hard. It is so hard to find the self accountability, right? Yes, the that time part. <laughs> like being like holding yourself accountable and being like, I'm doing this for a purpose. And I think when it really like hits me that it's that it's paying off and that it's working is when people contact me and they're just like, Oh my gosh, like I, I can relate to that. Or I have people say, like, I was just thinking about buying a first home and I didn't know where to start. Now I'm connected to somebody that knows how. Mm. And so like I think what really gets me going is engaging with the people that you know who is my audience um and that has been building those relationships it's not just like an interview for me it's never just an interview for me it's let's let's build something together let's collaborate in the future let's let's you know if somebody reaches out to me and it's like i'm looking for a graphic designer uh that's undocumented hey i know four or five of them i'll hook you up you know? nice. And so it's all about showing up for each other in different ways. And I think that is what keeps me going is that I know it's making a difference now. But before it was really like pulling myself <laughs> to do it. Um, I know that I had a co host when I first started and her heart just wasn't in it the way that mine was. And so, you know, we collectively decided it was best that I just continued. Um, and if you pour your heart and soul into something and you're authentically showing up for it, people are going to see that people are going to love that right? Like if people believe in what you do and you do it authentically with so much love and compassion, like there's no way that it won't, that it won't have that tipping point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk about that a little bit, the part where, you know, like you had to separate from your partner. Um, and, you know, I feel, I feel like there's always like a very conscious way that we could go about doing that. So it doesn't, you know, have any sort of animosity on either side. Um, but I know that, you know, especially if you're working on an, on an event, like you're probably going to be a part of, of a, team. A, a team, right? And so there might be friction or there might be, you know, situations 
situations where you have to say, all right, well, maybe we need to part ways or maybe, you know, somebody else might be better to work on this part of the project. Uh, so can you talk about even collab- collaborating from a team perspective um, and that dynamic and how to make that a more um, fruitful relationship? So first, I have to admit that it wasn't a good transition for us in our mm-hmm. relationship as friends and people and working partners. It wasn't. Um, okay. But now that I reflect on it, right, the way that I would approach that is so differently. Um, you know, it was never, you know, I was taking it so personally, but it wasn't about me, right? Mm-hmm. There were other things happening in that person's life that, that 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 took priority that they needed to focus on in order to be their full self. And that was that didn't include this project. Whereas for mm-hmm. me, it did. For me, this was... I knew I wanted to do this. My heart was in it from the beginning. Um, And I do have another person that I work with, Caleb Nelson, who's a producer. And, you know, we're always learning how to work together, even though we've been working together for three years. Right. And, and I think, you know, establishing like, yo, we care about this work. We care about what we're doing. How can we make it work for both of us? How can we both be flexible? How can we both, you know, show up sometimes to those late nights that we have to pull. Right. Um, it's all back down to communication. And, and that's hard. That, that is one of the hardest things that people have to learn and also like holding yourself accountable to how you also react, how you and your body language responds. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we're often talking about communication about, you know, between two people, but also like, how do we hold ourselves accountable to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is, that is helpful. That is, um, going to allow you to grow as a team, as partners. You know, I know conflict comes up in a lot of team dynamics. There's ways, you know, there's actual ways to work through it. And a lot of that means mediation. A lot of that means stepping outside of it and realizing that it's not about you personally, that it's about something else. Um, If, you know, I think if you have this goal and you're all like driven by that goal, it'll be so much easier to attain. But obviously there's going to be hiccups. There'll, There'll always be hiccups, you know, and when, you know, an event is happening and it's day of and you're running around with your head off and everybody's coming to you for everything, just like take a second and breathe and like be, be happy that people are even there. Right. Like, if anything goes wrong, the show goes on. Everything keeps going and going and going. We are flexible. We adapt. We're adaptive leaders. That's how we survive in this world. We adapt to our environment. We adapt to the team we're working with. We adapt to the way that we work in environments. Um, so I guess that's my advice is like, hold yourself accountable. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. And I always think about, you know, when when I'm irked by someone, I think about, you know, well, what is it in me that I could change or what can I do differently to make this relationship um, a better relationship or a better working relationship, right? Or what is it that I need to say? Because sometimes we don't necessarily talk about like, what is it, what it is that's going on in us internally. And instead we kind of like lash out or um, it comes out in, you know, unproductive ways. So for sure, I think that that's such great advice um, about, you know, looking at yourself and seeing what you could do about it and how can you hold yourself accountable. And for sure, that part that you talked about with, you know, when you're working on an event and you're running around (laughs) and you have to be flexible and adaptive because for sure, you know, there, I I don't think I've ever worked on an event where something didn't go the way that it was supposed to. It's Murphy's law, right? It always happened. So you always have to, you know, plan for those things to show up or happen that you didn't necessarily plan for, uh, but also being like quick on your feet and adaptive um, to being able to, to move through them and work through them. And then the thing too is, you know, sometimes when you're in that space and you're somewhat stressed out, you know, you, the, the people around you could be the ones who um, get the brunt of it, right? You might be sure, you mm-hmm. might be curt. Um, so it's also having like a really good team dynamic where the other person know or you know that, look, it's just, it, it was due to the stress, you know what I mean, of that moment. And it doesn't necessarily um, impact how I feel about you. And um, and it doesn't like ruin uh, the relationship as a result. Uh, so I think that that's so important. So Victoria, thank you so much for being here. You are a wealth of information. I just absolutely love you, your podcast, what you guys stand for, the mission that you want to create in this world. Uh, so let people know how they can stay connected with you. Uh, well, first, before you do that, I always like to ask, like, what is one last gem that you'd like to drop, whether that could be life related, event related, anything. So what's one last gem? 
my last gem that I honestly have learned in my solitude through COVID is stop and listen to the birds. Stop and really just take everything in. Go on a walk and and breathe. Practice your breathing. Sit in that stillness because event planning, organizing, everything is so hectic. Social media, marketing, all of it is so consuming. I think, you know, we need to make more time to ground ourselves and ground our spirits. Um, And that's how that's where we find the pieces of ourselves that weren't we didn't know were there. Right. Um, So that is my final gem for y'all. Beautiful. I love it. Okay. So let people know how they could follow you and stay connected with you. Yes. You can follow me at shotoftruthpodcast.com. I'm actually releasing a ton of my speaking engagement work there. Um, You can follow us on Instagram, on Twitter. We have a TikTok as well. Um, Just any of the social media, it's Shot of Truth Podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victoria, for being here. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe to Event Gems. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.